Hi, I'm Evan Anderman, an aerial photographer based in Denver, Colorado. Things happen in all our lives that can guide us in a different direction. If only we can learn to listen to them. I want to share with you the journey that I have taken that allowed me to bring my love of geology, flying, and photography together to guide my transition from consultant to photographer to artist and eventually to activist. I was born in Denver in 1964, the youngest of three. My father was a petroleum geologist from Albuquerque. My mother, who dabbled in mountain real estate, was from Kansas City, Missouri, and she met my dad while attending the University of New Mexico. They both loved the West and being outdoors, having started their marriage in a tent in Wyoming while my dad conducted his dissertation research. We did all the usual Colorado activities, hiking, horse packing, river rafting, fishing, and hunting. I attended college at Princeton and decided to major in geological engineering and headed off on what I thought would be my career. I strayed somewhat from my father's career by becoming interested in groundwater after I wrote a research paper on the Ogallala Aquifer. I took a year off and, among other things, worked as a roughneck on a rig out of Gillette, Wyoming. I was a big believer in the establishment and quote-unquote progress, not really questioning the way that society was choosing to inhabit its environment. I completed my graduate studies at Colorado School of Mines and then consulted to the U.S. Geological Survey for a couple of years on the Yucca Mountain proposed nuclear waste site in Nevada, mostly writing the software that they used to model the flow of groundwater away from the site. As others have said, there's a beauty to math, and I really enjoyed the process of conceptualizing a new capability for the software and then deriving the equations and writing the code to make it happen. Photography was in the background for me at this time, and I tried to keep with it on the side. But something was about to happen that would change that. My journey to activism really started when I was working as a consultant for a small consulting firm specializing in using groundwater modeling to aid in litigation support on environmental issues. As I said before, I'd always been a big believer in the establishment before that, but then one project in particular really made me rethink that belief. Chemical contamination was found in a water supply well of a trailer park in Plaquemine, Louisiana, a chemical that just happens to be manufactured in a nearby Dow chemical facility. This is a view of the area made by Richard Mizrock as part of his Petrochemical America series. It makes a nice backdrop for the story. Our job was to defend Dow by poking holes in the groundwater flow model. The model was prepared for the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency by a reputable consultant and reviewed by another reputable consultant. Yet somehow the results failed to show the contamination going from A to B. The report goes on to say that, despite the results, the chemical obviously did go from A to B because, you know, where else would it come from? As I dug into the model, it took me quite some time to figure out the problem. They had used a GUI, a graphical user interface, new at that time, to lay out the model and based it on an aerial photograph to lay out the extents of the model. The photo was calibrated in meters, while everything else, you can guess it, was expressed using feed. I wasn't happy about having to work on this project because of the obvious environmental impacts Dow had made and we were busy defending. But I also think the government has a duty to do things right when they go after people. Just the fact that the model was presented at all, given that it didn't really work, but in my mind is a ruse to make people think that they knew what they were doing because they had a computer model. And that it was published by one big consulting company, having been reviewed by another one while having a glaring error, just sent me over the edge. The sale of my dad's company at roughly the same time gave me the push to quit and be a full-time photographer. That was 2005. I want to backtrack a little and talk about flying. My love of all things aviation started early. Growing up, I always seemed to be interested in mechanical things and made lots of models of World War II airplanes and aircraft carriers and was fascinated by the space program. Somehow on my 14th birthday, I convinced my parents to let me take some friends up for a discovery flight in a Cessna 172 at what was then called Arapahoe Airport, now Centennial. That's me on the right with a camera in front of my face, taking a picture of the airport as we came in to land. This could be credited as my first ever aerial photograph, a rather unimpressive shot of the Cherokee Castle off Daniels Park, south of Denver. After my sister's college graduation later that spring, 
We visited Washington, D.C., and I literally spent three days at the new Air and Space Museum, even finding a typo in one of the displays. A couple of years later, my dad needed a faster way to get to his offices in Tulsa and bought this Piper Cheyenne II in 1980, which he used almost as much for personal reasons, flying us all around the West. I spent lots of hours in this plane, mostly in the co-pilot seat, studying every move the pilot made, and this really introduced me to flying. The low wing made it difficult to make any meaningful pictures, but it gave me an opportunity to start looking at the world from a different angle, in the time before Google Maps. This is a shot of the San Luis Valley, north of Alamosa, with the Sangre de Cristo shrouded in clouds. I started my instruction during a year off from college in 1986 and got my private pilot's license the following summer. After I graduated from college, the demands of work kept me from flying much, and I let it go. Life got in the way, and I didn't get back in the air until November of 2010. A couple of years later, I bought this Cessna 206 in Placerville, California, and flew it back to Denver with an airline pilot friend. Most of the airplane was original, and I started the slow process of replacing things. Avionics, propeller, then engine, and for all intents, had a new airplane. Several months later, in September 2012, I disembarked in Reykjavik at the end of a photographic cruise in the Arctic and decided that I wanted a different perspective from previous visits. So I rented an airplane for a couple hours to take some aerial photographs. It was the end of summer and a surprise snowstorm provided an interesting contrast to the landscape. I was shooting with a new Nikon D800 and everything worked out great as we went from one incredible landscape to another. I even got the inaugural Dougal Image Makers Award at the Photo Plus Expo in 2013 from this shot of a braided river with snow. This really made me feel like I was on the right track with my photography. When I got back from that trip, I started flying with the upgraded avionics I had installed in the airplane. I wasn't really thinking about photography when I had an autopilot installed, but I soon figured out that it would give me the freedom to take pictures while it flew the airplane. With the successful shoot in Iceland a couple of months earlier under my belt, I took my camera out over the eastern plains with me in February of 2013 to see what I could get. It was mostly an experiment for me and I struggled, trying to adapt to the fact that I would never get the perfect angle of the Jefferson grid system that is the foundation of everything that happens out there. But I finally got comfortable and made some good pictures. For some reason that I can't quite remember, I didn't take the camera flying again for two months, probably because I was busy showing photographs from my Arctic cruise in my studio gallery. It wasn't really until later that summer that I found the motivation to shoot from the airplane. And that brings me to the next big turning point in my life. In late July, 2013, I decided to get out of Denver and head up to the Pawnee Buttes, north of Greeley, near the Wyoming border. It had always seemed like such a remote place, far from the city in development, with natural beauty ready to be photographed. I explored the Buttes during golden hour and enjoyed seeing the shapes of the amber grass waving in front of the rock formations in the dramatic light. Even the forms of the far-off wind turbines didn't seem intrusive. But then the sun set and the stars came out, and I noticed something else. Naturally, the wind turbines each had a red anti-collision light that all blinked in unison almost to the horizon. I also noticed a yellow glow lighting up my van and looked to see what it was coming from. It appeared to be fire, thus the yellow color, and I figured out it must be gas flares at all the new oil wells encroaching upon the buttes from the southeast. I shot a long panorama showing the scene from which this is a part. You can clearly see the wind turbines on the left and the flares on the right and the light pollution from the flares. This was a major turning point for me. I had always known there was ranching and farming activity on the eastern plains of Colorado, but it had always seemed more in tune with what the landscape could support. The oil field was a major intrusion to the previously serene environment of the Pawnee Buttes. It was a real wake-up call for me, causing me to question what I'd always taken for granted before. It's amazing how a revelation like this can galvanize you to go out and look at the world differently. And that's exactly what I did. Luckily, I had the perfect platform to cover a lot of ground quickly and see things from a different perspective. Here's a quick video that shows you how I shoot from the airplane. Hi, this is Evan Anderman, and in this video I want to share with you my process for taking photographs from my airplane. I keep my Cessna 206 at Centennial Airport just south of Denver because it's a good jumping off point to easily reach much of Colorado. I fly over the eastern plains often, sometimes several times a week. I depart early in the morning or late in the afternoon, 
and it takes about 30 minutes to reach many of the locations I like to see. Once I get away from the airport and any traffic, I engage my autopilot and start looking for compositions. When I find something I want to photograph, I open the window and point the camera down at the landscape, look through the viewfinder, and start shooting. I like to see my subject from all angles, so I direct the autopilot to turn, generally to the left, so I get a better view of the landscape. My first priority is obviously to fly the airplane, so I always keep an ear out to hear any potential change that would indicate a problem. The airplane is obviously moving quickly, turbulence bounces the plane around, and the cameras can be persnickety. It's a balancing act keeping the camera steady in my hands while getting the best composition. I can't put the lens too far out the window as the slipstream will vibrate it. A lot of things have to come together to make a good picture, and some days go better than others. I like to fly over some places again and again just to see how things change. I also like the challenge of arriving at a new location and looking at it to see what is important, then try to capture that with my camera. Sometimes I do Google Maps research beforehand to help me pre-visualize what I might see when I arrive at a new location. There are a lot of variables that control how a picture turns out. That's why I like to see things repeatedly to get the best picture possible. So I started to take a closer look at northeastern Colorado to learn more about what was happening out there. Looking at it from space via Google Maps, there's a lot happening. This image extends from the front range on the left to Kansas on the right, I-70 at the bottom to the Wyoming-Nebraska border at the top. You can see Denver, Boulder, Fort Collins, Greeley, Fort Morgan, and Sterling. I-70 runs along the bottom. The river drainage system is the underlying vein pattern feeding into the South Platte River on the north or the Republican River to the east. The green circles are fields irrigated with pivot irrigation, largely corn, generally around the rivers, but you can see fields irrigated with water from the Ogallala Aquifer to the east. The gray areas are sand hills, and you can see the predominant wind direction is northwest southeast. These areas are difficult to cultivate, so they are where cattle are grazed. The rectangular areas are fields that are not irrigated, dry land farming, and are mostly wheat, although many crops are grown barley, sorghum, rye, oats, silage, millet, beans, and sugar beets. If you look really closely, you can actually see the concentrated animal feeding operations, better known as feedlots, mostly cattle, but also dairy products, chickens, hogs, and turkeys. In 2014, I had a show of this work at the Carmen Wiedenhof Gallery. This image shows where a farmer has plowed up a field to rough it up to prevent the wind from blowing the light-colored sand onto the seedlings growing in the field. You can see the lighter colored band going through the middle of the squiggles. In 2016, I had an exhibit at the Denver Public Library that some of you may have seen that summarized a lot of my early work exploring man's attempt to control nature. Given the venue, I decided to make this exhibit a little more documentary to show people the infrastructure that it takes to support us. The title is really a play on words. Like most things, it is really only visible if you go out looking for it. I was becoming increasingly alarmed about the environment and started to embrace the idea of sinister beauty, strong images that lead to curiosity in the viewer, and hopefully more engagement with the issues that may lead them to question their beliefs. Many photographers were starting to influence my work, such as Robert Adams, Richard Mizrock, David Mizell, Edward Bertinsky, Terry Evans, Frank Golke, and Eric Paddock. The show looked at three predominant themes, housing, animal feed operations, and energy. This is one of the golf courses at Castle Pines. Coincidentally, this is adjacent to the Cherokee Castle where I took my first aerial photograph at age 14. Here's a subdivision in the Sand Hills outside of Garden City, Kansas. If you put enough water on anything, you can get it to grow. This is a former trailer park adjacent to the South Platte in Greeley. Changes to the floodplain from upstream development resulted in this park being flooded out in 2013, and it had to be abandoned. Actually, there was a big lawsuit, as you might imagine. In this shot of the cattle feedlot in Fort Morgan, the cows are the little black dots in the upper right. Nutrient-rich waste is captured in these ponds, and at various times throughout the year, the algae will bloom in interesting colors. The stark difference in color across the fence lines of this pasture near Fort Morgan 
shows that even grazing has a significant effect on the natural environment. Here we see nutrient-rich hog waste contained in ponds near Yuma, but they still emit ammonia, methane, and hydrogen sulfide. Each of the 50-odd buildings in this picture at this chicken egg farm near Platteville contains nearly 20,000 chickens in a quote-unquote cage-free environment. A single fracking operation requires significant infrastructure and resources, as can be seen by these many trucks. Here's another fracking site with a tank of water awaiting injection. Here, rail cars wait to be loaded with oil, allowing it to be shipped anywhere without a pipeline. Overburden is removed to reveal the dark black coal seam at this mine near Gillette, Wyoming. This site, called Tire Mountain near Hudson, Colorado, holds 31 million tires, one of the largest repositories in the country. Owners claim they will be used to produce diesel, activated carbon, and steel. The receding shoreline of this reservoir near Lamar, Colorado, shows the effects of the ongoing drought in that part of Colorado. A couple of years ago, I started working on a project to document the Ogallala Aquifer, which is a large reservoir of water under eight states extending from Texas to South Dakota. I wrote a paper on the Ogallala when I first started studying geological engineering and always wanted to come back to it. The High Plains has an extremely arid climate and agriculture did not flourish there until a large body of fresh water was discovered and a way to pump it out and apply it to the land was invented in the 1950s. The problem for me was how to photograph something that is largely underground. I found this term overshoot, which was coined by William Catton to describe the condition when we use natural resources too fast and the population grows to a point that exceeds the resources abilities to support it and it collapses. The High Plains region of the United States is largely supported by the excessive extraction of water from the Ogallala Aquifer, making this a classic case of overshoot. This project seeks to document, from an aerial perspective, the effects that the excessive extraction of water from the Ogallala has on the landscape. I decided that the best way to show the aquifer is to photograph what it gets used for, mostly to water crops using center pivot irrigation systems. I started in eastern Colorado, and this is a large feedlot near Yuma, where the cows are fed from grain raised nearby. More pivot irrigated fields. There are lots of sand hills in eastern Colorado, probably not the best soil to raise crops on, unless you have an abundant supply of cheap water to overapply to grow crops. This is a field where the farmer has accepted a payment from the U.S. Department of Agriculture to stop irrigating, in this case to help the state of Colorado abide by its compact with Kansas and Nebraska to let a certain volume of water leave the state via the Republican River. As an aside, this photo is included in the Curious Visions exhibit at the Denver Art Museum that's on display in late 2021 and early 2022. I also flew down to Texas and learned that they have other concerns, where they have to farm around oil wells. Here the pivot irrigation system is raised above the oil wells with these berms. And of course they have a lot of feedlots. Oklahoma looks very similar, but has a mix of non-irrigated fields as well. This part of Kansas, south of Garden City, is especially egregious for its density of wells and fields. Northwest of Garden City, I discovered this large hog farm. The light-colored barns house pigs, and the effluent is stored temporarily in these blue-colored lagoons before they apply it as quote-unquote fertilizer on the fields. A quick internet search after the flight revealed that Seaboard Foods chose this location because of the weak economy and lax environmental regulations in the county. Over 180 barns are seen here that are permitted for up to 330,000 pigs. Now, pigs emit 70% more waste than humans, so this area is equivalent to a town of over half a million residents. So then the pandemic came along, and since I worked in a non-essential industry, I had some time at home to do a little deeper look at the background of the Ogallala. This figure shows a couple of things. The base map is from the most recent U.S. Geological Survey report on the water levels and depletion of the aquifer, the darkest red color indicating greater than 50% depletion. I spent a lot of time on Google Earth, locating all the feedlots and hog barns in the Ogallala area, and overlaid them on the depletion map. The little black dots show cattle feedlots, the blue dots show hog and chicken barns, the green pluses are processing plants. You can see that the areas with the greatest density of animal feed operations are also the areas with the largest reduction in saturated thickness. So not only is eating all this meat bad for us, 
It is exceedingly hard on the environment by inefficiently gobbling up resources and significantly warming the environment. Based on this map, I decided to fly down to the central part of this figure in between Dalhart, Texas and Guymon, Oklahoma to have a closer look. On the way down, I saw lots of green fields and hog barns, but also feedlots. And I wanted to share this video of you when I made this discovery near Dalhart, Texas. There you can see all the dust from this enormous feedlot and the one behind it. It actually might be a dairy because there's a lot of covered parts to it. This indeed is a dairy, but it looks a lot like a feedlot to me. And it turns out that it holds 7,000 head of cattle. The barns are ventilated, but that is mostly to protect the workers from the noxious gases that build up. And the feedlot behind it is also a 7,000 head dairy. And the one behind that is also a 7,000 head dairy, three in a row. And when I got up to Oklahoma, I found a lot of hog farms. I also found Optima Lake, and I thought you might find its story interesting. So here I am at Optima Lake at the, uh, the visitor overlook as it were, and I think this is a fitting place to end this video because this just exemplifies the plight of the Ogallala, the, at least in the southern high plains. You know, they started building this dam in the 70s and obviously thought there was going to be enough flow in the river to fill it up, but then they obviously didn't think about the depletion in the aquifer and how that affected the flow in the river. And so it was quickly apparent that there would never be enough water to fill it up. And um, now we're left with this. But they built all the campgrounds and a huge dam, obviously, and this, this spillway structure over there. And you can see there's no water in it right now. Of course, this is October, probably the driest time of the year. So, so what's going to happen to the Ogallala Aquifer? The author, William Ashworth, calls it the long farewell. The problem is that the yield of a well is dependent on the saturated thickness of the aquifer, which obviously decreases as the aquifer is depleted. So the farmer has to pump the well more hours to get the same volume. Also, it takes more energy to lift the water farther as the water levels decline. So this is a double whammy that costs the farmer more money. And when they can no longer afford it, they stop pumping. This won't happen all at once, and it may take years. It's not clear if dry land farming is a viable option, especially with the changing climate. So to me, the fate of this whole region is up in the air. The pandemic also gave me time to research the effect that our factory farming system has on the environment. Some of you may be familiar with a presentation like this that shows the greenhouse gas emissions per serving of various proteins. Food production produces almost a third of all greenhouse gas emissions. I really like this presentation prepared by Our World in Data by Joseph Poor and Hannah Ritchie, based on data from Joseph Poor and Thomas Nemechek. The data is from 38,700 commercially viable farms in 109 countries. You can see that there is a wide range in emissions for each protein, depending on the efficiency of a given farm. The white dot shows the median value for that protein. Obviously, beef has the highest emissions and the highest range, the upper tail extending way off the chart to the right. Emissions decrease for lamb, farm shrimp, cheese, pork, chicken, eggs, farmed fish, tofu, beans, and peas. Nuts actually have a negative value because they are taking other crops out of production. Let's focus for a second on what exactly these numbers mean. We see that on average, producing 100 grams of beef emits 25 kilograms of carbon dioxide equivalents. In other words, producing three and a half ounces of beef, roughly a quarter pounder, emits 55 pounds of greenhouse gases. On the other hand, an entire package of tofu, which has four and a half servings, emits only 14 pounds of greenhouse gases. The red line at the bottom shows the sum of all proteins weighted by actual production around the globe. The green box on the left indicates that 75% of protein production is in a relatively low range, but the additional 25% actually produces 70% of the emissions from protein production.
This study was very comprehensive and looked at a number of other factors, such as land use, acidification from fertilizer, eutrophication of waterways, and water use. It's a lot to take in, but I find it fascinating to study these charts for a little while. It's a little hard to make comparisons because each grouping has a different scale, the ones at the top being much larger than the ones at the bottom. I think the general takeaway is that animal products are worse than plant products, and so we should all reduce our meat consumption to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. As I mulled over all this information, I decided that the best way for me to help out the environment was to switch to a plant-based diet. I like to say that I'm a climate vegan. It's been a year and a half and I'm still going strong. I've lost some weight and my blood work is much improved, pulling me away from the pre-diabetic state my previous meat-laden diet put me in. Who knew that taking some pretty pictures would lead to this? If you're interested in learning more about the Ogallala Aquifer, I highly recommend these two books. Ogallala Blue by William Ashworth is a good introduction but the John Opie book, Ogallala, Water for a Dry Land, goes into much more detail. I think the activism part is not just becoming a vegan and leading by example, but also by sharing my story and the information with you firsthand so you can make your own decisions. I hope this empowers you to do the right thing for the environment. We all need to be in this together. None of us can fix it alone. But the journey of a thousand miles starts with the first step.